Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe. Now, Vomelana Advisory Fund is a non-profit organization that works with land reform beneficiaries and has called on government to heighten awareness amongst the beneficiaries of the land reform program. This includes laws and policies governing access to water as well as post-settlement support. I spoke a little earlier to uh, Peter Seto, who's uh, chief executive of the Vomelana Advisory Fund, to further unpack some of the challenges being faced by land reform beneficiaries, particularly around access to water use. Well, the land reform process has been painfully slow and uh, really has struggled to uh, meet some of the expectations of uh, many, many South Africans. Um, a lot of these farms have become economically inactive. Um, what would you say have been some of the contributing factors to that? Well, there are a number of reasons uh, to, to the state of affairs. But I think in the main, lack of post-settlement support. Okay, you must remember, at a point when government uh, you know, gives land back to our people, in most instances, they don't have access to finance. They don't even have access to markets. And in some instances, they don't even have the technical know-how to actually run some of these businesses. That's why it's so important that the post-settlement support is actually provided to the beneficiaries so that they can put their land to productive use. I know that one of the issues has been uh, water use rights uh, affecting land beneficiaries. What happens typically that these water rights are missing and yet they get land? You know, Peter, water and, and, and land are actually interconnected. Uh, and while both of these resources are actually critically important for sustainable de development, they've often been managed sort of almost separately. I mean, for example, you've got water being managed by a different department and, and rural development and uh, restitution being handled by a completely different department. So we have a situation where at a point of the transfer of the land, these rights, water use rights are not uh, you know, transferred to the beneficiaries of land reform. And this in itself has created a number of challenges. I mean, we've got a number of projects that fail because water has not been avail availed for production. And, and really this points to the fact that we need to make sure that there's synchronization between land reform program programs and water allocation. So who do you think is to blame here? Do the beneficiaries not know about the, their rights and they get excited about the land and then only realize afterwards, my goodness, actually we need the water to go with this? I think the, the combination of factors. One, if you look at available water rights, I mean, 90% or up to 95% uh, of, of available water usage rights are actually in the hands of big commercial farmers. And you've got about the remaining, about 5% or so, in the hands of your you know, upcoming and mostly your black farmers. So you have a situation where your smaller operators and new operators are actually competing for this scarce resource, first and foremost, with experienced players. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the regime itself, the, the licensing regime itself. I think it's a, it's a bit slow um, to actually take into account the fact that at a point when the, the land is actually allocated, you don't have the luxury of actually waiting. You need to start waiting the land. Thirdly, issues around access to finance. It's one thing to get the land and to even get those water use rights. Because remember, when you get these rights, it means you must start paying for this water. So that's why the whole issue around addressing pertinent issues around access to finance for land reform purposes is so key. But lastly, I think just awareness amongst our people about the water use rights regime. I think there's a critical need for government in particular and other role players to, to embark on educational programs so that beneficiaries of land reform can really know the do's and don'ts and what to do actually to apply for some of these rights. Do you think then uh, laws, uh, legislation, and some of these policies really need to be looked at? 
Well, I, I think one must concede that uh, when it comes to policy and legislation, we do have uh, policies, we do have legislation in place. I think the challenge really lies with implementation. We need to, I think government needs to start really improving on how these laws and policies can be implemented. We need to make sure that we enforce some of the uh, these rights and ensure that there's compliance on the ground. Because if you don't enforce compliance, things are likely to remain the same. And lastly, I think we also need to make sure that we've got monitoring and evaluation systems in place. Because if you don't do monitoring and evaluation, then you 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 can't actually affect any improvements because you 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 don't actually use the lessons that you would have gained from doing an evaluation as a basis to effect improvement. So I think this for me really go in tandem. How do people go about um, getting uh, these uh, uh, um, uh, you, water usage rights? How difficult is that process? Well, I think that's exactly the point. We need to demystify that whole process. We need to simplify that process. We need to make sure that uh, there is more broader access to such information. I mean, the custodian in this specific instance is the Department of Water Affairs. And, and, and I think really this is a challenge for them to make sure that they can embark on awareness creation uh, you know, initiatives to make sure that people can be aware mm -hmm. of, of this water usage rights, including how to access them, et cetera, and how to apply for them, et cetera. You mentioned the slowness of the process. Um, what kind of a backlog is there in terms of uh, uh, licensing of uh, water use rights? Well, the, re the reality is even before you start talking about the backlog, uh, remember the problem that I raised earlier on to say, at a point when the land is transferred, we found in many instances that the land is transferred yet the previous owner retains the water use right. So that in itself is a problem that needs to be addressed. So that is the first thing. Secondly, once the land has been transferred, you have a situation where these beneficiaries of land reform don't actually know where to start in, in terms of ensuring that they can apply for this water use rights. That, that in itself also creates another layer of, of delay. Thirdly, once you actually apply, uh, the there's, there's, there are possibilities that either your application is lacking or there are certain things that you did not include, which might actually make the whole process a, a bit longer, which is why it needs to be streamlined. People need to be educated to say, this is what you need, because if people know exactly what is it that they need to do at a point of application, the process could be more streamlined, it could be more efficient, and those licenses could be issued more expeditiously. You said that uh, what often happens is that the previous owners keep a hold of the uh, water usage rights. Is this deliberate or is this an oversight? What, what is happening? Well, I think at the core of this challenge is the fact that I've raised earlier on to say water and land are actually interconnected. Mm -hmm. you know? But unfortunately, you find that this true most important resources which are required for development are managed by two different entities, if you like. So, so you have the Department of Rural Development, Agriculture, Rural Development, and Land Reform, responsible for, amongst other things, land restitution, for example. But you have another department which is really responsible for your water usage rights. So I, I guess it's a whole point of coordination to make sure that this government departments can start collaborating more closely to make sure that the processes are more smooth. So these two departments, I mean, are they aware of the challenges that uh, these land reform beneficiaries are facing and that you as advisors are, are having to try and overcome? And if that's the case, what are they doing about it? Well, Peter, uh, I must say, from our side, uh, being on the ground as Vumelan Advisory, uh, advisory Fund, mm -hmm. we, we, we have certainly picked up some of these challenges. We constantly raise them. And it is for that reason that an organization such as ours exists, so that we can support beneficiaries of land reform to you know, navigate 
through some of these, these challenges. We do that through, you know, offering transaction advisory services, through independent transaction advisors who would assist them to create partnerships with experienced, uh, you know, investors and, and landowners, et cetera, et cetera. But coming to your point in terms of whether the departments are out, I mean, we, we've had a number of reports already. We've got the, the panel, it's the, the, what's normally referred to as the Motlantia report, which has certainly highlighted some of these challenges. There was also an advisory panel, presidential advisory panel on land reform and agriculture, you know, which you know, identified some of these challenges, including coming up with suggestions on how this could be addressed. So the, the information is out there. I think the challenge really lies with how do we make sure that some of these reports, including the recommendations of some of these reports, can be implemented. I think that's what we need to do as a country. I want us to go back to perhaps where we started and look at the whole land reform process again. And I just wonder, as the uh, targets set for the National Development Plan uh, draw ever closer, what do we need to do to perhaps revive this land reform program and, and make it happen, happen quicker and more meaningfully? Well, a lot of this information is already available on, on, in the public domain in terms of what is it that we need to do. I mean, uh, from our side, first and foremost, there's a huge demand on the government facing us. For us to really expect government to deal with all these uh, social ills and some of these challenges, I think uh, we, we can forget if we are to give any meaningful debt to sustainable land. So the involvement of the private sector is key to make sure that there is development, which is why we are actually advocating for partnerships with investors in the land reform space who've got the requisite access to capital, who've got the requisite access to markets, who've got uh, the skill sets as well. So that for us is the best. And secondly, we need to provide post-settlement support. At a point of really transferring these land parcels to, to our beneficiaries. It's pointless if you give them the land without giving them some form of support beyond that because you, it's almost like setting them up to fail. So for us, that's really the second. We've been talking about water rights. We need to make sure that water use, the availability of water use rights is actually integrated as part of the transfer process so that we don't have a situation where there's a lull from the point where the, the land is actually transferred to a point where the beneficiaries can start meaningfully working the land productively. So for me, that's that's one of the issues. But there are a whole range of other areas where we need improvement. But better collaboration, for example, within government, various government departments that are, are involved in one form or another in land reform. I think we can, if we can begin to streamline some of those uh, you know, actions, we'll start seeing a lot of uh, traction in that regard. But, but for really for me, what one needs to emphasize is in the context of the current economic environment, I think it is critical that we should really, government should support especially your partnerships with the private sector to make sure that land reform can be sustainable. And that's where we're going to have to leave it. Uh, the Chief Executive of uh, Vomelana Advisory Fund, Mr. Peter Seto. Thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us. And we wish you the best in helping our people with the land reform process. Thank you very much, Peter.